As the country gets ready to celebrate its independence, it seems like a good time to take a look at our energy independence. And let's look at how the Biden administration's directives have changed our energy consumption. And it is Wednesday. Let's make time for this week's Farmer Forum. Live from the foothills of False Friday via Farm Journal Studios, <laughs> this is AgriTalk. This morning we'll begin with a conversation with Phil Flynn from the Price Futures Group. Then it's our Farmer Forum with panelists Rock Ketchnik and Casey Schumacher. Directly following the news, Margie Eckelkamp from The Scoop. I'm a handsome newsman, Davis Michelson, and now say hello to the host of AgriTalk, Chip Flory. False Friday. I like that. I That's like that it, a baby. lot, dude. Mm-hmm. That's a, it it mm-hmm. does kind of feel that way. A little bit. A little bit. Because I got that, that sort of Friday, you know, feeling. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, huh, I got a little yeah. air in my schedule in the next couple of days, uh, but it's wow. not Friday. Wow. Love it. Love it. Yep. Markets are closed tomorrow. Uh, government offices closed tomorrow, uh, mm-hmm. but today we are up and running, and <laughs> the bean market is is really doing a nice job of putting on some gains today. But the wheat market and the corn market, it they're acting like they couldn't be bothered. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, crude oil prices have set back very slightly, still trading above eighty two fifty in most of the contracts, and and. Uh, we got Phil Flynn coming in. The, when he wrote his morning comments today, mm-hmm. he was on fire, man. Ooh. They are so good. And he's taking a look at the energy independence of, of the U.S. And, and uh, uh, I, I can't wait to get him on here and get him talking about how, you know, his views – of how the energy industry is doing here in the U.S. It's going to be really, really good, I think. So, I can't wait. And, of course, we've got the Farmer Forum coming, too. Rock and Casey, uh, mm-hmm. we will uh, we'll get crop updates. We'll get uh, some of the challenges that they've had to deal with this spring, and then we'll get into some of the – some of the the issues uh, that that are affecting the cattle industry right now with Casey – and I can't wait to get Rock's take on on uh, the presidential race and, and what he thinks is going to be happening Yikes. there. Okay. Yeah. Very yeah. good. All right, let's get to the news. What do you got, buddy? Sure thing. The National Weather Service is expecting excessive heat with potential records to continue to impact much of the West through Independence Day and into next week. Triple-digit high temperatures are expected this weekend In parts of the Pacific Northwest, dangerous heat to persist this week in the Southern Plains, Gulf Coast, Southeast, and Mid-Atlantic. Heat index values will approach or exceed 110 degrees at times. We were, our heat index here in Kansas City hit somewhere around 104, 105 yesterday and can confirm that gets, that gets a little toasty. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that it does. Uh, we've, uh, we're only 75 degrees up here in Northeast Iowa right now, mm-hmm. but the mugginess has come back. Yeah. I, it, I don't think we are expecting any rain today, although it, it wouldn't surprise me if it would rain. Mm-hmm. I mean, it rains easy up here right now. Right. So, What's the status of the big muddy lagoon over there? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, it, it is rising and it's going to be within inches of, of uh of my uh my front door <laughs> oh boy I don't <laughs> yeah like it's getting close no well you mentioned it but u.s grain and other futures markets will trade normal hours today the equity markets today will close at noon central time mm. bond market closes early at 1 p.m central all u.s markets and government offices will be closed tomorrow thursday for the july 4th holiday that means the uh, u.s weekly export sales report delayed until friday mm-hmm i uh, got a daily sale here, 110,000 metric tons of soybeans for delivery to unknown destinations. Of the total, 55,000 metric tons for delivery during the 23-24 marketing year and 55,000 for delivery during the 24-25 marketing year. Ag economists are increasingly pessimistic about the financial health of the U.S. crop sector, but more optimistic about livestock. The latest Ag Economist Monthly Monitor survey reveals concerns about low exports and crop prices. 
Conversely, strong beef demand and cheaper feed prices are boosting optimism in the cattle sector. Despite slight pessimism overall, projected net farm income for 2024 increased to $113.9 billion. That's actually up from $110 billion in May. And that's actually down big time from 2023. Uh, that's part of the reason that we're feeling some tightness in the industry right now. Yep. The report also notes U.S. ag trade deficit is expected to rise to $32 billion in fiscal 2024, driven by a strong dollar, increased imports of used cooking oil and horticultural products, and softer U.S. ag exports. Mexico projected to become the top importer of U.S. ag goods, surpassing both China and Canada. Home affordability in the United States is the lowest since 2007. The costs of a typical home, including your mortgage payments, plus property insurance and taxes, consumed 35.1% of the average wage in the second quarter, according to Atom. Uh, Not only are homes more expensive, Chip, but also the cost of maintaining and uh, insuring homes. uh, Adding to that expense. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, you kind of alluded to this. I'll go quick. Top Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi and Jim Clyburn, have expressed concerns about President Joe Biden's debate performance and viability as a candidate. Pelosi and Clyburn acknowledged that it is legitimate to question Biden's cognitive abilities and overall fitness for the presidency after his lackluster debate performance. Chip, over to you. I'm telling you, it's it's going to get uh, tough for him to stay in the race if if. Uh... The Democrats start to turn against him. All right. Thank you very much, Davis. Let's bring in Margie Echelkamp, editor of The Scoop. Good morning, Margie. Hey, Chip. Good morning. Talk to me about uh, the supply chain realities and just-in-time deliveries. Yeah, I've had three recent conversations that really helped illuminate what is going on in the supply chain and and really how manufacturers, suppliers, distributors, ag retailers, and farmers can learn from these series of black swans event, events that we've lived through 2020. So whereas we went through a time where, frankly, folks were getting as much inventory as they could because of overall supply chain security issues, you know, whether it be herbicides or fertilizers, et cetera, now those full warehouses and fully stocked warehouse shelves are are less common. And one of the reasons is because of the higher interest rates And retailers are really working down their inventories to avoid draining their working capital. So what this also means for suppliers is they are looking to only have retail and distributors hold inventories really at a minimum amount. So that just-in-time manufacturing or surge manufacturing. And the key takeaway there is this really requires planning ahead And maybe just as important, communicating that plan. And I know with acreage shifts and other in-season decisions, that can be tricky. But it really sounds like if we're looking into the crystal ball of the future, those who communicate their needs are going to be the ones with the securest supplies. All right. Yeah. Communications. It, I mean, it, who'd have thunk it? It's always really critical in making sure that you've got to keep your business running. Margie, thank you. For th- thank you. Thank you, Chip. All right. Margie Echelkin of The Scoop. We are talking energy markets, energy independence. Then. In the morning. You're coffeeed up and you're thinking. In the afternoon, you've calmed down, but you're still thinking. We're here all day. Agritalk. And welcome back to Agritalk. I'm your host, Chip Flory. Glad that you are with us on this Wednesday morning. We got to talk about what's going on in these energy markets, and uh, the the guy to to help us do that is Phil Flynn, energy analyst at Price Futures Group. Phil, it is great to talk with you again. Happy Independence Day! Happy Independence Day! Happy Independence and Oil Independence Day! I, I'm going to go out and celebrate, and I'm telling you, American ingenuity of shale oil we've changed the world and hopefully we'll continue to do so for the future 
Yep. I'm telling you, dude, you were on fire when you wrote your report this morning on <laughs> energy independence. What a great read, Phil. Well, thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. But, you know, I'm feeling really patriotic, you know, and when I think mm-hmm. about, you know, where this country was, you know, I remember I'm an old guy. I remember, you know, the gas lines. I remember being afraid that, you know, the uh, OPEC countries are going to cut us off. And, yeah. you know, I remember uh, Jimmy Carter wearing a sweater saying our best days are behind us because we can't produce enough oil. Uh, and, 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 and we have people in this country that said no. We're not going to accept that. We're going to find a better way. And the Shell Revolution did that. It changed the world. And it's one of the reasons why the United States has one of the most dynamic economies on the earth. Yeah. Well, and you can argue that uh, the, the Shale Revolution made the country a more secure country uh, when we don't have to kowtow to and, and send billions of dollars to countries that want nothing but harm for U.S. citizens, um, we're all going to be better off if, if that's the case. Absolutely. You know, and I, and I think one of the things that, you know, people in the environmental mu- movement, uh, you know, fail to realize uh, is that fossil fuels has provided this country with unprecedented, uh, you know, national security. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so many times people have argued that we've got in the foreign wars because we're trying to protect our oil supplies and, you know, maybe got involved in things that we shouldn't have got involved with. But that all changes if we unleash uh, American ingenuity here at home and allow these energy companies to do their jobs. And 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 that's the story here in. You know, and I understand you have to be good stewards of the environment. I get Mm -hmm. that. Every farmer out there listening to this show is with me on that. But at the same time, you have to be realistic and you have to realize that fossil fuels have improved the lives of everybody listening to this program. Uh, It's it's lifted the poor out of poverty and and expanded our lifespan. So there's a lot of positives from it. Oh, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. So talk to me about the Biden administration's efforts to change how we consume energy. Are they working? Is is it showing up in usage data? No, I think it's been an abject failure. No doubt about it. I mean, hmm. we just have to look at the push towards electric cars, right? Um that is failing. Everybody realizes it's, it's unworkable. Uh, there was a headline that came out that 48 people that bought an electric car are having buyer's remorse. They want to go back to an internal combustion engine. So that's not realistic. If you look at the amount of electricity generated, we're, we're consuming a record amount of electricity. Um, and even though more of that electricity is being um supplied by interruptible power sources like wind and solar, the percentage is so small based on the investments that we have made that it doesn't make any sense. And even with that, uh, it has raised the cost of a kilowatt hour to an all-time record high. And yeah. anybody who gets that you know, electric bill say, what are those darn kilowatts doing? You know, they keep yeah. going up, up, and up, and you're, you're paying more for them. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, it surprise surprise we're using more of of a a product that we don't produce enough of and the price is going up surprise surprise um shocked totally shocked (laughs) exactly exactly but at the same time here we are we've got crude oil prices back above 80 bucks a barrel uh wti and it feels feel like we're going to we're going to take a run at 85 bucks is what it looks and feels like to me. What are your thoughts? No, I absolutely agree. You know, and if it weren't the holiday weekend, I think we'd be close to that level today. I mean, we did get the uh, energy information administration report and we had a massive crude oil draw of over 12 million barrels, 12.157 million barrels, which is huge. And and I do think that's the combination. You know, I've been waiting for this draw for the last three weeks. You know, I think the um, government's had a hard time counting these barrels. Uh, they had a lot of supply mixed in with other categories. So we've been expecting this crude drawdown. And I expect to see more big drawdowns in crude supplies 
I think right now we're heading into uh, the, the, the rest of the year where we're going to start seeing a global supply deficit. What that means is the demand for oil is going to be near record highs and the production is going to be less than that. Okay. Um, and, and when we look at it on a, on, a, on a global basis, as you just described, how much of an impact does that have on U.S. oil prices and, and therefore uh, prices of gasoline at the pump? You know, I think they're bottoming out and they're going to start going back up. Yeah. I mean, uh, the globe is seeing supplies tighten significantly. Um, and what we're seeing, of course, is increased geopolitical risk as well. And that's adding to the cost. You've got the Houthi rebels and the Red Seas. Now they're threatening U.S. air carriers. Uh, you've got the war uh, between Russia and, and Ukraine that continues to go on. They're talking about more sanctions on Russia. Uh, but even you have the possibility of the war in Israel um, expanding in the Lebanon. So all these issues add to the cost of oil every day because it, it costs so much more money to transport oil, produce it. So when the risks are high, the prices are as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Phil, are the energy markets telling you anything about the presidential politics in this country and what the what what the elections how how they might turn out? It is. I mean, in fact, you're seeing signs of desperation from the Biden camp already. Yesterday, uh, they announced another release of a million barrels of gasoline from the North East okay. Gasoline Reserve. This is the second time they've tapped that reserve. And I'm sure they're going to put out a press release and say, boy, what good guys are are we? Because we're trying to lower gasoline prices right before the holiday. Um, but it's really optics, right? We, we just got a report that the demand for gasoline last week was over 9 million barrels a day. So this million barrels, um, Chip, I think you're going to burn that in your car that week, this weekend. I don't know. <laughs> it could be. That could be gone. Uh, so. You know, this is optics, and this is the problem with this administration. They don't have a clear energy policy. They're all over the board. It's like we don't want fossil fuels, but then again, we want to talk to Venezuela to get their oil back online or talk to Iran and not put on sanctions, but then we want to put more regulations on the U.S. But the good news is I think there's a snapback coming, right? I think the Supreme Court threw out um, – uh, the, the Chevron decision, which basically mm -hmm. allowed the federal government to make up the rules as they went along. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we're seeing the um, LNG pause that the Biden administration put in place. A Louisiana judge just shot that down. So it seems like the country is going away from the madness and coming back to the center. And that's where we need to be, because our economy is going to need record amounts of energy in the next couple of years. And while we're playing these silly games you know, politically, we should be making steps to meet the demands of the future because our economy needs a lot of investment in fossil fuels, alternative fuels. We need to let the sector do their job. And if we don't, we're going to all pay the price. Do you do you feel like the incentives are in place or are coming to encourage the production that we need? No. I, I mean, yeah. prices will eventually drive it, right? But no, I, you know, I think, you know, the policies globally, um, when it comes to, you know, this energy transition and mm -hmm. fossil fuels are bad, don't invest here, don't drill here, doesn't really make any sense. Because if you do the math and if you do the science, these things are going to leave us woefully under, under supply, you know, whether it's oil, electricity, you name it. Um, you know, um, and, and the thing is, is that you and I know that the future is going to be driven by power, right? Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence, data centers, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the economy of the future. Don't tell Pete Budovich. He thinks it's electric cars. It isn't. Shh, don't tell him. It's going to ruin right. his day. The real thing is going to be, you know, tech and data centers. And we yeah. are not prepared to meet that demand in the future. Right. We need to move in that direction quickly or we're going to have problems. Phil, uh, like I said, you're. <laughs> I, I love having you on here. We we get uh, some perspectives mm -hmm. and a dose of reality uh, that we need. Thank you so much. Happy Independence Day and great job on your on your report this morning. Thank you, buddy. God bless you, sir, and enjoy. All right, Phil Flynn. 
Price Futures Group. We got the Farmer Forum coming up next. Time for Markets Now with the experts from Pro Farmer. Joining us now, Pro Farmer editor Brian Grady. Beej, I was looking at the soy complex and hoping that that was going to pull corn and wheat to the upside, but I think corn and wheat are going to start to pull beans down here. What's going on? Yeah, uh, a little bit of a weaker tone. Not much uh, selling pressure in corn and wheat, uh, but but a little bit of a weaker tone. About two cents lower in corn at the moment. Uh, mostly uh, one to two lower in the uh, winter wheat markets, and then spring wheat it's it's about six cents lower. But uh, it, you know it shouldn't have a whole lot of influence or as much influence right. as the other two wheat markets. Now um, you mentioned the soy complex, so soy oil continues to rip to the upside. You know, let's call moderate gains today, so not as strong as what we've seen earlier this week, uh, but still uh, notable, and that's uh, allowing the soybean market to continue to work off its recent lows uh, amid some corrective buying here ahead of uh, tomorrow's holiday. Now, unusual because we have Thursday off and then come back for Friday price action, but uh, um, you know, it's it's kind of like a weekend and, and kind of not <laughs> exactly exactly uh the the cattle complex is trading like it's a friday isn't it yeah absolutely so we're still waiting on active cash cattle trade and, and honestly that may not come until friday and it may not come at all because uh, packers may try to string things out they bought a lot of cattle in the last three weeks with the run to record highs in, in each of those weeks and and uh so uh, we'll have to see. The The supply situation is tight. The packer probably doesn't want to get too aggressive uh, in chasing after supplies, and, and more likely they'll try to, to reduce some slaughter runs. But they can't reduce them too much because they've already cut back so far, and, and so right. we'll see how that all plays out. But uh, feeders are, are leading to the upside there, and then kind of mixed trade with a lower bias in the hog market this morning. All right, good stuff, Brian. Thank you so much. Pro Farmer Editor Brian Grady on Markets Now. Opinions expressed on Agritalk do not necessarily reflect the views of Farm Journal Broadcasting, affiliate stations, or sponsors. You're listening to Agritalk, where the conversation begins. Join us at 855-4-TALK-AG. And now is when the Farmer Forum begins. Welcome back to Agritalk. I'm Chip Flory. Uh, Davis is here. I know you're there someplace, buddy. I'm here. Yeah, no, I'm right here, in fact, yeah. Fantastic. Let's get this thing started. Rock Ketchnig over in Illinois. How are you, Rock? Good morning, gentlemen. We have a very good outlook on life this morning. We had a real nice rain last night, three-fourths to an inch here in northwestern Illinois. Okay, northwestern Illinois. Here I am in northeast Iowa, which is not that far from northwest Illinois, and we wouldn't it, we could do without that three quarters of an inch. There's no question about it. But you were getting dry, not that far away from us, weren't you? We were, Chip. Uh, the sand on the light ground, non-irrigated, was rolling up, turning white, going backwards. <laughs> and you know, we would grab a two tenths, a four tenths, six tenths. We couldn't get a good soaker. So no, uh, all that heavy stuff that unfortunately you've received has all been north of us. And uh, yeah. Anyway, we got a good one last night. We've got a lot of corn starting to pollinate, you know, here at the 4th of July. So everything looks good so far. We had a really huge hail event, Memorial Day Monday in our area. And I'm going to say it's the biggest event I've seen in my lifetime. I, I'm going to say roughly 10,000 10, acres were affected. Wow. And that a lot, corn... of, a lot of soybeans. Well, a lot of soybeans that were just coming up looked like you took a scissors and snipped them off at yeah. ground level went in and replanted those real quick, but there was corn that was in early. It was knee high and uh, a lot of pictures. It, it looked like an asparagus patch. It just completely yeah. defoliated that plant. And, you know, we're never too old to learn in this game. Uh, some was torn up, a lot was torn up, started over. Some was left and it's going to be interesting this fall to see uh, yeah. which was the right decision, which way, the way to go. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's, uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's always fun to, to, um, find the results of those decisions out the problem is you find the results out when it's too late to do anything about it that's that's the heck of it uh, no doubt all right rock stay stay there let's bring in casey schumacher out in uh, northwest nebraska hey casey how you doing good morning chip doing good 
Good. It's good to talk with you again. It's been too long. I hope uh, I hope things are are doing okay for you out there. We're not doing too bad. Got to enjoy it today. We're kind of having a nice, cool day. We oh, we've hit a hundred already a couple days, but kind of get these little deals going through where we'll be in the seventies and eighties. Just need to catch some moisture. It, it's it, just like you were just talking about how spotty that's the case out here. We're we're back to the regularly scheduled two weeks away from a drought. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. How are things looking? You, you, you got everything planted on time out that way, didn't you? Yeah. Everything's yeah. looking really good. We've had, uh, you get into the, uh, central Platte Valley, central Panhandle Platte Valley. They've had some storms go through and do some hail damage and stuff like that. But everybody that's, uh, caught the rain and missed the missed the nasties is looking really really good okay all right uh pasture conditions out your way how are they must be pretty good aren't they they're they're really good they're the it's yeah. going to be a concern here if we don't keep catching moisture they're going to be oh we had a little storm go over two nights ago and there was four fire starts off of it oh okay wow wow how'd the calving season go for you casey Really good. We're we're into fully everything's May and June calving now, and that's pretty nice. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Can you believe what they're worth when they hit the ground? This is just unreal. And surprisingly, you go to the grocery store, and uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem like they've increased at the counter near as much as they have on the hoof. Yeah. Yeah, that, I th- I think that's exactly right. Yeah, Rock, what's your take on what's happening in the livestock industry? Biggest consumer of of U.S. corn and and soybean meal is is the U.S. livestock um, industry, and we got to keep it healthy if we're going to keep demand strong for for the corn and soybeans that you're growing, man. Well, it's all about supply and demand, and I've been out of the cattle business since 08 at a cow-calf mm-hmm. herd, and, you know, it took a lot of the fun out of it, feeding $5.50 a bushel of corn to cattle, and it went seven fifty. But right now, I'm hearing bucket calves, day-old bucket calves, $750, $950. It's just mind-boggling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, unbelievable. I never thought we'd ever see this. Yeah. Yeah, it it is really something, you know. We, Casey, we talked for a long time about how we needed to get some of those retail dollars all the way down the supply chain and get it back to the the cow calf producer. Well, it, it's there. There is there is no question about it. Uh, and there's some meat on the bone for a feed yard, isn't there, Casey? There is. Margins look really good going forward, and you know, much to the detriment of the corn farmer. Uh, but I went back and was looking through some records. My my best cash purchase was September of 2019. I bought a bunch of corn for $2.90 cash. And with basis and everything, the other day I was 18. I could have bought corn for 18 cents off that. So I think we're going to get to a point here where we're going to start to buy some demand in the corn. And, and guys are going to, even with these high prices, there's some meat on the bone to go to work. Yeah. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. How old is that feed yard that's going up in the southwest part of the state? Black shirt feed yard, a hundred and fifty thousand, a hundred and fifty thousand head. Um, there, I think we're okay. A hundred and fifty thousand head on concrete down there, Casey. That's a an incredible operation, isn't it? It's going to be really neat to see. There's an operation, oh, about halfway between uh, me and that feedlot that just put in a bunch of roller compacted concrete down to Bridgeport, Nebraska. I haven't got down to see it yet. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. It, it, it does offer opportunities there to do a better job harvesting that manure and get the fertilizer value out of it. And, you know, it. It's a real, we don't get that much rain out here, but when we do, and in the wintertime, that seems like it'll be a lot nicer on the cattle. Yeah. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting, and it's and you know we've been wondering for a long time what the what the impact of the beef on dairy uh, was 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 going to be in the on the feeder cattle market. Well, we're going to find out because it sounds like every every head that's going on there is going to be a dairy cross calf, right? Yeah, and I think the interesting thing from guys I've been talking to is uh, speeding up the finishing process. So uh, I, I think we're we're going to see a little more variability there in what's available market ready wise based on you know the market conditions because yeah. just like the beef cattle, uh, they can feed those a little bit longer. We can get into this heavy carcass weight situation we have now, and right. uh, I, I think it just adds a little more variability into the market. Right. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to switch gears on you guys a little bit, and I want to get Rock back in on this conversation. Rock, I've been thinking about you a lot as I'm trying to make sense of what is happening in this presidential race. You know I respect your thoughts and your opinions on on uh, on on the political scene out there. What's your take? What are what are what are your thoughts? Well, to sum it up, two words, real scared. And a lot of my friends, same comments. Uh, you know, you didn't have to, don't have to be a poli-sci major to uh, read between the cracks of what's going to take place here. You might call it emergency maneuvering. And I'd promised Joe I'm going to try to stay as politically correct as I can. <laughs> but anyway, if you want to step back and just think about production agriculture in the United States of America, if we want to turn it into a big California. Mm -hmm. Think of the impact on our, our jobs and our future out here in rural America. So mm -hmm. that's a real big question we have to look at here coming up in just a few months. Yeah. What do you, th what, um, what is the future for Joe Biden? Is he going to stay in the race? Do you think? You don't think there's a prayer. Yeah. Yeah. No. Don't. Don't. You know. Anyway, we have to. Now, the debate, doesn't that? You know, it's quite. How? What does that do to the outlook for the election? Then, I mean, if it, <laughs> because right now the way things stand, Trump's going to be the next president of the United States. But if well, I, you know that. Go ahead. That that's a, that's a reason I mentioned emergency maneuvering. I have to find a candidate real quick who is much more electable. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I have no idea who it's going to be, but all of the sudden, the party that wanted nothing to do with Kamala, with, with, uh, Kamala Harris, with Vice President Harris, all of the sudden is starting to warm up to the idea of a President Harris. Um, it, it, it could happen sooner than later is, is what, uh, is what it looks like. Your thoughts? Well, uh, <laughs> another name that pops up is our, our governor of the state of Illinois. And, hmm. uh, anyway, we just had another two cent increase July one on fuel here. And, uh, it's going to be interesting between now and November. And as I mentioned, uh, we're, yeah. we're pretty scared of what's going to, the outcome's going to be here. But as I mentioned to Joe, I recall a dollar 68, a gallon farm diesel at, yeah. uh, when the last man was in office there. Right. Right. Okay. All right. We are in the middle of the farmer forum. We've got rock Ketchnig from Illinois, Casey Schumacher from Nebraska. Casey, I want your take on the presidential situation. That's next. On your favorite radio station or your preferred digital device, Agritalk is live every weekday. Welcome back to Agritalk. I'm your host, Davis. We sound okay to you. Is everything okay? I'm sorry, buddy, but you do not sound okay. That's Chip Flory. I'm your pal, Davis Michelson. Chip's having a little connection problem down there as the river encroaches nearby there we've got a farmer forum going today we got rock ketchnik from illinois and casey schumacher from nebraska uh chip how you feeling buddy yeah. still waiting to come back let's uh get yeah. casey 
I tell you what, Casey, I'm going to bring you in and give you give you a chance to speak to the uh, presidential election. I'm just curious what your thoughts are, sir. Yeah, I think it's going to be real interesting going forward. If uh, Biden is replaced, I, I I see us having an extremely low turnout. Uh, the thing I think everybody needs to look at is, uh, you know, Trump did win a competitive primary, and any replacement for Biden will not have gone through a competitive primary. I think that's a uh, big disservice. That's kind of not not the American norm to have an anointed candidate. So I, I think there's some struggles going forward. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of vetting that takes place in that, a lot of discovery about who a candidate is during that primary. Uh, that's that's an excellent point, Casey. Um, Rock, you mentioned that it does. It feels like the worm is turning just a little bit. Um, we've seen that in in elections in South America and now in Europe as well. But but the Supreme Court here in the United States has been hard at work. We got Chevron overturned. Um, w- would you care to re- reflect on some of that? Well, this energy situation uh, is really scary, and of course, every every person's affected by the cost of fuel. You know, uh-huh. whether it be gas on the farm, di- diesel on farm, gas, whatever. We have to get a handle on this. Inflation is just a runaway train, and it's affecting people at a serious enough level right now that I think uh, it's going to have a huge Im- impact in the polling booth. Yeah, yeah. voting yeah. booth. Chip, we got you. Yeah, I'm I'm back here, um, trying to trying to listen in, be part of the conversation here. And, and oh, you know, Rock, I think it comes down on the political. It's got to come down to the economy. And are we, you know, are people better off today than what they were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? And it's uh, the the answer for a lot of people is no, we are not better off. What's going on in deer layoffs? Well, it's like black and white compared to four years ago. Uh, deer is a huge employer in our community right here. Been generations of families raised from deer and the other manufacturing people down there. And with the, these layoffs and with the mm-hmm. price of machinery going up, it is just machinery is a runaway train. Yeah. Yep. It, it certainly is. No question. Casey, what's your take on some of the Supreme Court decisions as they wrapped up their session? I was pretty excited to see some of some of those decisions come out. The Chevron one's a big one for me. I I, I don't side with the unelected bureaucrats. I, I like to see some right. accountability at the end of the day. And yep. I, I, you know, we've got vast experience with that in agriculture. And I I hope to see it move some needles on some environmental regulations. You know, maybe the EID uh, proposal for cattle. We, we got a we got a couple different deals coming up that I think it matters to. I think you're absolutely right, Casey. And and it's it's the Supreme Court telling Congress to do your job, do your work. If you're going to if you're going to write rules and regulations, um, put some specificity into it so that uh, guys like Michael Regan at EPA aren't the ones that are setting the rules and, and regs on their own. I think I think you're right, Casey. I think. It's going to take time for us to see the benefits of it, but I think it is going to be a, a, a good thing. I, I really believe it. Hey, Packers and Stockyards, Casey, we had Ethan Lane on the show yesterday. He's afraid, and, and the folks at NCBA are afraid that it's going to uh, it, it's going to kind of get rid of some of the competition out there and the incentives to increase quality and so on with the latest reading on Packers and Stockyards. What's your thought? You know, I'm always nervous when the government says they're here to help. Uh, but I think <laughs> there's some discussions that aren't being had about this, that it, maybe we haven't been doing things uh, the correct way. I, I caught yesterday's show, and, uh, you know, since it was kind of brought about, we, we've based our base prices off the average cattle. And, the packers are the ones who determine the premiums and discounts and you know i, I kind of think that's backwards i think 
maybe we need to be price, pricing these cattle off our best cattle and going backwards. You, you know, uh, the Packers know what they have for demand wise on their premium meats and what they're selling. Uh, that, that's why you, you see Packers have margin on some of this stuff because they know what they're, they're getting into. I, I think we've, for too long, we've been pricing things on the average and instead of working our way back. And I think right, right now where we have leverage as cattle producers, I think if anything's going to change now is the time to change. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. And we've got an opportunity to see things change. It, it's, uh, there's, there's no question about it. Um, rock your final thoughts as you're going into, uh, the, the 4th of July and independence day. Well, our crop conditions are good, uh, but we're in for a very scary time here. Interest, interest rates, interest is a silent killer. And uh, I, I would advise young producers to pay down debt and get in a better financial position. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Casey, your final thought? Yeah, I agree with Rock. I think it, 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 we got a lot of stuff coming down the pipe that the person has to pay attention and uh you, you definitely don't want to get out ahead of your skis. Yep. Good stuff, you guys. Great job today. Rock Ketchnig over in Illinois. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you. Good talking to you again. You bet. Rock, rock, rock. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thanks for listening. Certainly appreciate it. Come back this afternoon. We've got Luke Beckman from Central Valley Ag right here on Agritalk. Everything I need, nothing that I don't. Oh, everything I need, and nothing that I don't.